All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, talking about um, our themes for this week, uh, which are in East Africa and looking at the subjects of Ethiopia and uh, Kenya. So we'll take a delve into those subjects. Um, and, and, you know, just a, sort of things remember, and we'll obviously we'll look at maps and some things while we're in class, but, but just remember the context of, of this, you know, the, the, the Great Lakes region, which we talked about prior, and maybe we'll, we will remind as we look at some maps, you know, less so for Ethiopia, but certainly for Kenya as a sort of, uh, a sort of regional epicenter of culture, um, of, uh, you know, sort of uh, exchange of ideas of different peoples and things. And it's in this place that, um, you know, um, into the upward, you know, mid to late 19th century, uh, Europe, had, you know, is engaged in this sort of process to, switch, to sort of try to take what they can out of these places, right? Um, and control the waterways around these places, uh, um, you know, as a way to stave off their own enemies in Europe, right? So Western Europe, and, and, and not necessarily allied together, as you all know. I mean, this is also bumpy. By the end of the 19th century, some of the prior relationships, I mean, Europe that kept Europe together due to, you know, the end of the Napoleonic Wars are, are coming apart, right? I mean, World War I is going to be one culmination of that. But these colonies play in that um, because as um, the various European powers go at these colonies and go at each other to get at the resources and, and control of the waterways and other geographical regions, um, the violence e e erupts and, and uh, um, it just becomes, this is a feature of that. So, so this is, you know, in, in large part, what, what's the backdrop in many ways to, to, to what we, you know, we'll sort of talk about today, right? Um, and Ethiopia is an interesting one because if you recall in all of our sort of discussions, this was mentioned early on in the class, that Ethiopia was never, you know, colonized. It, it's occupied for a time by um, uh, the uh, Italians um, under Mussolini. We'll talk about that, um, but it's never um, sort of um, effectively colonized uh, um, for a range of reasons. One of them is this, is Menelik II, who, you know, um, in the latter part of the 19th century, when he sees the various sorts of European uh, armies and other sort of uh, trading nations and, you know, trading uh, co corporations and other things begin to start moving in and around, um, you know, you know, he makes pretty clear his stance. If powers at a distance uh, come forward to partition Africa between them, I do not intend to be an indifferent spectator, right? And that's a hint that he's just not going to sit on a sideline and allow essentially his land to be sort of, um, um, sort, 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 sort of marched over and taken over, right? Um, um, and, 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 you know, the, 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 the state of Ethiopia itself, or Abyssinia, I guess we should say, is, is dealing with its own challenges um, in terms of the, the sort of regional conflict that's going on, right? Primarily externally, uh, um, the Mandi and, and, and the European, right? So you have this sort of emergent Muslim sort of fervor too. I mean, they're sort of erupting out of the Sudan, what we were, what, what was, was known, you know, as Nubia, uh, um, you, know, I'm at the, you know, in antiquity. Um, what will become the country of Sudan, which is at this time part of a sort of Anglo-Sudan protectorate, right? But they are erupting out. The Mandi is leading um, um, this sort of eruptive movement of change. And, and of course, these people are flooding further south and also obviously east into the region where um, we see, you know, the, the modern day country of uh, Ethiopia, right? Uh, um, so, so that sort of external piece is playing. And I don't mention it here, but there's some internal things that are starting to sort of machinate as well. And we'll, we'll get to them too. Um, but, 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 but really, um, the Ethiopian church is a sort of vital national symbol, right? It goes back to antiquity. Some of you have had the Africa since, uh, or two 1600 course, recall, you know, discussions of the Zagwe kings, right? These are the folks who write a different version of uh, what, what we know as hands curse. Remember, they, they take on a different sort of tenor when they talk about this interrelationship of the three sons, not the Europeanist idea of a cursed people, right? I mean, there's that. I mean, there's a range of this sort of ancient history. You know, these are the folks who claim a sort of connection to, um, you know, um, a Davidic lineage, right? We're going to we'll talk about that in class some, um, but but all this sort of stuff uh, as features into why it is that the Ethiopian Church is a sort of very important national symbol. It had been prior to these moments of sort of uh, increased European uh, um, interest um, and push into the region, right? Um, and um, he had this sort of co-rulership. And this is a hint at 
some of the dynastic issues that are rumbling in the state of Abyssinia in the latter 19th century. Uh, these guys will be sort of, of uh, sort of co-rulers, Menelik and Johannes. Uh, um, and, and, and then that process began to annex and sometimes develop, but sometimes not develop these lands. It's almost in terms of lands of just in terms of possession land in terms of power, right? Uh, um, and, and went forward with their own sort of intentions to modernize and to emerge as a more modern state. Uh, um, in, in counter to the, the to the claims of Italy, who at the time were sort of saying, "Yeah, we, we want we want this right," and, and and Italy's just shy of a generation past its own nationhood. Remember, um, you know, Italy has its own moment of na of, of nationalism, right? Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it in class, and um, you know, um, so they're young. But you know, there's this, I think in Western Europe, I, I mean, you know, folks may disagree with this analogy, but it's sort of keeping up with the Joneses kinds of thing. Because what England and France are doing, you know, Germany wants to do, uh, and then the Netherlands have to get into it. And then, you know, certainly, uh, you know, France is already, you know, was early in, but, but other groups um, too will start to play. Italy's gonna want to play in this, right? Um, some of the, you know, nations that are, don't have as many, many resources, and you say, well, why isn't Russia or this or that? Well, because Russia, you know, kind of has its own like the United States, it, it, it sort of could spread out to Ukraine and other places and dominate its neighbors in ways that, um, you know, Western Europe sort of protect itself against. And the colonies was in part their, their, their buffer, their perceived buffer, as well as against the Muslims, the Turks, right? Ottoman, right? Remember this kind of stuff. This is the tension that you, you got in Europe at the time, right? Um, so, so you have to look like you're strong. And this is the reason I think for in large part why Italy will um, I'm go forward with this effort and uh, uh, attempting to first to annex Maswa and then uh, a portion of the Eritrean coast, right? And then they started to make their move on Ethiopia in December of 1896 with about 25,000 soldiers. You come upon uh, Abyssinian army who is almost, you know, five times the size of your, what I'm saying, five times, uh, uh, almost 10 times the size, you know, um, of your army, right? Um, and they got guns from, you know, remember there's tension, there's rivalry here a little bit, right? The, the, the French are trying to get into Djibouti, which is just near this region as well. Some of this is at work here in terms of why it is that all of a sudden the Abyssinian soldiers have access to or able to purchase or procure um, weapons for many of their soldiers. And, and when you can come out on a battlefield like that, armed just as equal as the other, there's, you know, you don't need to send out your entire you don't need to send everybody out. You, know, you sit up and, and wait and send out a couple. You have to send everybody out because this one's gonna be over pretty quickly, right? And they were routed. And then uh, from that comes the Treaty of Al-Badis Adaba. Um, and it will secure what we could call Abyssinian independence. Now I'm saying what we could call because you know people will come with the criteria of the name, the Ethiopia, the Abyssinian, all this other old stuff. But, but, but don't get lost in all that. It's just, and it is a valid thing to have a conversation about. You don't lose sight of what has happened here. Is that, and that's that you have an uh, African state um, defeat a European one and gain uh, its independence and its autonomy, right? So much so that it will be at the League of Nations. It will be recognized at the League of Nations. So, I mean, that's significant. There are no other, other, other African countries uh, um, are, are there or are, are participants there. Right, and, and, and it did hit, gave a symbolic notion to folks. It was a symbolic reminder, I think, that, um, that, that many people could galvanize around, especially people in America. We, 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 we get all cheesy, Black Americans get cheesy about Ethiopia for our own you know, sort of spiritual reasons and connections. A lot of it echoing Du Bois's sort of making of a Pan-Africa which centered Ethiopia. So a lot of us, we, we buy right into that. I mean, rightfully so, but not necessarily, you gotta be careful here. Uh, Ethiopia and, and even to some degree Egypt as these center points or nodes of Pan-Africanism. Um, careful here, they're, they're, they might make sense in more mythic ways, but in the real tangible ways, you know, as you know, there, 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 there's more and more at work here, right? And so maybe for this wider speaking to this Pan-Africanist voice, this idea of African states as not being inferior could be conveyed. But you know, if you think about something like Yasantiwa in 1900, 
or you think about some of the uh, um, way in which some of the, the chiefs uh, in uh, Nigeria um, and the Egba chiefs responded um, to the British, right? That, that brought on the real provocation because they walked up in there like they thought they could do whatever they wanted, right? And people and people pushed back on that. Um, there are other, uh, other instances uh, throughout history. On the other side, the Mandi, which we didn't, I just only mentioned there, um, you know, part of what happens there, uh, expertly depicted in a film starring Charlton Heston, is that Charles Gordon is assassinated, the British uh, uh, emissary to this region is assassinated because he, he's bold enough to presume this sort of stuff. Uh, the idea you guys were just regularly presumed to be inferior, so I can just walk out here and that was right wrong. Um, so so, so it's, it's this kind of a thing that, that is getting in um, uh, um, as part of this symbolic notion of um, even if you go to places like, like South Africa, they would speak very clearly to you of a tradition of their own histories of resistance prior to 1923 and Abyssinia um, to Europeans. So this kind of thing, right? So just it's just a thing to, to know, but it will galvanize folks. It will make a collectiveness. It will, you can see the image there is, is, is on the bottom there, it, it speaks to something very real, right? I mean, I mean, I mean, it's sort of idealized certainly, but to put Bob Marley, to put, um, um, Rob, uh, Marcus Garvey, sorry, um, to put, um, these are some of the leaders of the, 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 the church of uh, um, Ethiopian church, right? And others together uh, with, a, with Haile Selassie there. I mean, this is all very much conveying something very much, I, I, I idealizing something in terms of some connections uh, uh, of identities of blackness, not necessarily African, it's blackness to antiquity. And that's a powerful hit. Uh, so, so, so I don't want to downplay it that way, but, but, but just know and be able to sort of gauge out what, 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 what can actually be going on here, right? Because I think if you ask Africans whether or not, I mean, I mean, people living on the continent uh, at these moments, if, 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 if this myth of, in, what this myth of invincibility meant, you're going to get a range of different responses and not all of them are going to be acquiescent to the notion of a myth. I mean, we already know that from what we've already just, just researched here in our own discussions on throughout throughout the semester. So, 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 but, but, but just know, I mean, this is part of the feature of this. I mean, and maybe that's part, part partially why, I, why, why I mention it, because what role is the boys going to play and, and, and really, and really making the case for and, and, and articulate what is this pan Africanism I'm saying. Um, what, what, what is that going to really play in, in, in terms of Galvin? Is it going to be transformed? Is it going to, is something going to come from that? Well, yeah, the answer is yes. I mean, many, 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 many nations, including Ghana and other places, gain their independence on the premises of these ideas, being mythic as, as, as they are, being as mythic as they are, right? So th th this kind of thing, a catalyst for Afro-Atlantic dialogues of internationalism and independence. So yeah, uh, um, people from Jamaica go to um, Addis Ababa and, 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 and um, go there to visit pay respect to local folks and, and get invited even to come and settle. There's an interesting piece around some people who actually did go settle there. Um, and I've always said that I need to get a hold of some, some of the evidence of that event and let that folks sort of cipher through that to see that sort of issues that they face and, and, their, and their measures of success and failure for, the, for that matter. But, 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 but this was a thing, this was a, you could, this will reverberate to the world. And they, I mean, think of this, you're living in the Jim Crow South. There's probably only a couple of papers where you might you might catch a glimpse of this story. Um, the Chicago Defender, you might um, you might catch a piece of it in and maybe um, Garvey's paper for sure you would. Um, it's a little bit later, so probably probably not. I mean I mean I mean Garvey's you know um, second decade in uh, you know nineteen teens. You know what I'm saying this is eighteen uh, ninety six. So so so. Uh, but but this gets you know people catch the, the ear of this people catch the story of this and it gets out and, and, and it does become something that people can use as a way to galvanize broader stuff so again imagine you're stuck here in the space of uh, uh of a jim crow south and you hear about the reverberations of this an actual nation an actual an entity and, and because it's christian too and it fits into this sort of judeo-christian ethic of our own experience that's another real very very clear tie-in so you got maybe sort of Du Bois's ideas of consciousness and spirituality sort of coming together in something interesting. Anyways, I don't want to get too far off track on that. 
Um, but that's the, that's the impact maybe globally of what happens in Ethiopia, that this place won't, won't gain its independence. And remember, we looked at it and compared it to Liberia. You could see when you said, well, well, Liberia was never colonized either. Well, this is a little bit different though. Isn't this a little bit different from Liberia? Okay, right, all right. So, but things get complicated especially um, as, as things sort of move, move further down. I'm not necessarily talking about World War I because I think I, you know, I, we've sort of talked quite a bit about it you know, in the context of things, but, but, but uh, um, just this whole kind of thing. As, as tensions start to heat up again, you know, tensions leading to World War II. Oh, you know, I always, I always laugh, my, 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 my good colleague and um, you know, sort, of, sort of one of my mentors always calls this one war. And I, I, so I, you know, I kind of agree. He says, no, World War I and World War II is just one war. He said, they just took two, two decades to rearm and finish fighting. And, and I think that's probably about correct. Um, you know, it's one war. People just took a minute. Let's, let's take a break and they gotta get back at it. Because issues that were, were, were come out of World War I never get resolved. I mean, I mean, I mean why is Germany so frustrated? Why is Germany at the forefront of both of those instances, right? And trying to be competitive with Britain and France. And why aren't they, right? Think about that stuff, right? And then when Germany gets kind of strong and they, and they snatch up Alsace and Lorraine, remember that during um, the Franco, uh, 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 the Franco oppression war, right? We talked about it um, and, and how that played out. And France could really essentially do nothing, right? And Germany could not only take <laughs> Alsace and Lorraine, but then they could also to make uh, France pay a war debt, right? So what will what will um, France and Britain do to Germany during World War One when Germany finally loses a war, this war, right? Uh, oh, they punish Germany. Remember how much they tried to charge them to pay in terms of war debt? Uh, and I mean, yeah, that's World War One. But will that play into World War Two? Of course it will. You guys already know the story. I have to into the details of it. By the time the Deutschmark isn't worth nickels and people are using the, the, the money the Deutschmark to, to, to light the fire because it has such no, no, you know limited no, no, no value and an economy is you know in, in shambles in the wake of war debt and other issues related to um, the German economy integrating itself in a, in, a, in a way more viable with Europe you got the ground created for what will come. Um, and, 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 but, but this is, that isn't the only point of tension in the, on the globe, right? There are several others, isn't there? Right? Uh, we always talk about the rape of Nanking. Some folks know that story about when the, um, Japan invaded, um, invaded into, uh, uh, into China, right? Uh, into Nanking. And it's, it's a very horrible incident. It's, it's one that's remembered with a lot of sort of, sort of sadness um, and, and memory, a lot of people put it in a very, very sort of problematic light, right? There's another incident that, that, that people say as a sort of precursor um, to um, the real violence of the war. Well, the other one is obviously the sort of crystal knock, you know, and these kinds of things that will occur there, right? Another one of these is the bombing of Ethiopia, right? Um, by um, uh, Mussolini, right? Um, and it's part of their effort to sort of reoccupy and try to take over um, um, uh, and take back Ethiopia. Remember, they tried in 1896 and failed. So fast forward to um, this period and you have uh, uh, an emboldened Italy under the leadership of Mussolini, right? The sort of the, the first sort of the fascist, right? Uh, or maybe the ground, he laid some groundwork for Hitler, I guess you could say it that way in Europe, I don't know. Um, but but at any rate, you know, he's, he has his own emboldened plan for changing and transforming you, uh, Italy into a fascist state. We, that we know, right? And, um, you know, as, as he comes to power, um, you know, ideas of expansion start to come into play again, dominating other places and people's resources to, especially in a way to help build out his own effort to, to engage in the war. Let's do it. Right, and so what do they do? Well, they load up a lot of planes and use a lot of resources to drop mustard gas on Ethiopia. You know, it's a horrible situation. So much so that in '36, um, Haile Selassie will appeal to the League of Nations. Right, we'll talk about this in um, our class. You know, these three events, as I'm as I'm mentioning, right, uh, Kristallnacht, and, and which is a part of the sort of establishment of, of, of in, in Europe. Of, of uh, Nazism, some of you guys already know that one. Um, Rape of Nanking, right? Um, some of you guys may have heard that one, but this third one you may not, you may not have talked about. 
which is the, uh, you know, the sort of just massacre people in uh, Ethiopia, right? The bombing of Ethiopia, right? So we'll, we'll, we'll look at each one of those a little bit more detail so you can see them. And they are considered these sort of catalysts to World War II. But again, I don't know. I mean, you know me. I, 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 I would step short of saying it because why, why, why has Pearl Harbor become more significant in, in, in the wake of these events, right? I mean, I mean, because it will pour the U.S. in, sure. And maybe that's sort of, sort of the features of the context. But, you know, you know, you know, you're left lingering questions around how receptive folks were to acknowledging these events because they, occur, they occurred in places like Abyssinia in Africa or China and in Asia. So, but, but, but this kind of thing, but, 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 but you know, w w in those moments in the late thirties, um, this is gonna lead us to war, right? And in the wake of these events and in the coming of these events, uh, uh, um, you know, strange things are happening, right? Um, you know, and it's funny because pr previously early on, Hitler uh, um, supports um, Selassie against Italy, which is strange, right? Um, and so that, I think, is what prompts Haile Selassie to actually write a letter to Hitler in 1938 seeking assistance, right? Uh, and then, too, I, I, think, I think part of it is Germany's facing a, a, a European war, right? Um, and, you know, so it's picking and choosing its allies very closely, right? And then and in these moments, you know, it, Italy's coming into some problems because their war machine is, is, is running into the reality of they don't have enough you know, resources, this kind of thing, right? Um, but, and in the midst of this, you got these secret talks um, to, to sort of try to force Haile Selassie to submit. Um, and, and, but this, this, this issue, the way they would have to go about it in, in secret tells you very much so that all of what's going on, this idea that Italy can now go over here and try to occupy Ethiopia, or even that, you know, you have people still holding on to their colonial possessions during amidst World War II. Think about France and the free Brazzaville context stuff now in that light that we talked about before. Um, and this idea that, you know, um, here you have a, 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 you know, you know, very important leader in Central Africa whose name just, I'm sorry, went out of my mind there, uh, Felix Abouye. Right, who's gonna make a strong, strong case for the independence of his people because they take the French in during the you know moments that France is under a Vichy regime, the Germans occupying France, and then they come run to hide in, in Central Africa and be protected and received there, but they still see it as their colony. And then the, the folks there say, Well, we want to gain our move towards independence, and the response is like, Well, you know, no. I mean, yeah, partially, but no, you know, this this kind of thing, right? And that that I mean, what a duplicitous thing, what a duplicitous sort of moment there, right? But, but, but that, in, in a, that sort of, that suggests some stuff to you. The power is weak there, it can't hold it. So you gotta snatch it because you can't hold on to it regularly. I mean, maybe that doesn't make sense. Uh, maybe you don't, maybe you just, you don't even hold power that way. That's the issue, that's the nature of it perhaps, I don't know. But, but, but something there is, is quite suggestive just the same way with this. Now you bomb the place out, you bomb the heck out of uh, the, the Ethiopia, right? And, and yeah, you're not as successful as you want to be because Ethiopia is hilly and mountainous territory in some places. So you couldn't get everybody and you couldn't do as much damage as maybe you want to, but you caused some damage by dropping um, um, loads of straps of mustard bombs on, on this land, right? So that's gonna cause some problems, right? And, and then now after all that, now if, you're, if your colonial regime is that powerful, you come in, take the place over, walk down, this is it. You ain't still, you ain't even have to, Haile Selassie is, is done for, right? He becomes sort of, uh, 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 you know, a bit, a, a small, a small afterthought, right? Think about, um, I mean, and this is maybe a, a very problematic reference, but it, it, it certainly illustrates the point. You think about how after the dropping of those two bombs in Japan, how did Hirohito have to respond to, um, you know, the emergent power from the West or not emergent by this time, you know, the United States, right? I mean, I mean that, 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 that's complete submission and being forced to in a wake of extreme violence to protect the rest of his people, right? That is different from saying, Let's go over here and let's go grab him secretly because what we want him to do is give up his land and give up his claim to his land so we can step in quietly. We want him to do it, right? 
and, and it didn't make sense in light of uh, occupation um, between 36 and 41, that was never accepted and could people continue to fight against, right? So, so, so those kinds of things, right? And of course, of course, of course, this is a denunciation of the League of Nations. It's a denunciation of all the ideas of the Atlantic Charter, which will come later. Uh, all these kinds of things. It, it puts out in a very, very negative, negative terms, um, the ways in which people are sort of, uh, uh, um, you know, affording rights uh, and civil liberties of citizenship in Europe, but denying them to folks abroad or outside of Europe, essentially, right? And similarly, the United States, right? This kind of thing, right? I um, mean, even up further, I mean, why are you trying to, why do you gotta send the, the Vatican, the secretary of the Vatican, Pope, Pope Pius XII, who has his own interesting history relative to, um, you know, um, um, you know, um, people, Jews escaping from um, violence and, and, and other things in Europe, right? Um, he's got, he's related to that history there as well, right? Uh, um, but he's the same person who will offer Selassie $1 million uh, to advocate the throne. At about one million dollars to advocate the throne. I mean, again, this is not what you do if you're trying to go ahead and take over and you have the might and the power to steamroll in. It's not how you do it, right? Um, and so again, instead, uh, it had the same sort of effect that it would have that that it had uh, 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 in um, 1896, just uh, about you know 40 years prior. When after um, Ethiopia routes the Italians, um, the whole sense of Pan-Africanism and this sort of global internationalist mindset becomes expansive. And really, when in the midst of the occupation, the same thing happens, right? You got people who actually try, and some succeed as Black Americans to leave the United States and go and fight for the Ethiopian army, right? You got a pilot from Chicago who does just that. We'll talk about him in class, right? And so this kind of a thing, I mean, so there's some, there's some significance at work here, but you can see this is vitally uh, um, sorts of be, needs to be sort of unpacked. You have to see all this in the context of the features of World War II, how we remember World War II, right? Um, all of these things play into maybe our, our perceivings of, of what is uh, uh, Haile Selassie doing engaged openly in a negotiation with Hitler or and even privately to determine the fate of his nation. What is he doing there, right? So, so, so certainly that, 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 that speaks to it, right? Um, this kind of thing. So, um, but, but, but things, oh, it's just, it's hard to sort of conceptualize, I think for maybe people of the diaspora um, and I mean, outside of Africa, maybe, I don't know if this is true or not, um, the, per, the perceptions of how monarchy may function there and its impact and its meaning, one, two, um, the tensions that may exist around monarchy um, in, in the wake of um, sort of European aggression and, and not to mention your own inter-ethnic sort of tensions and, and things that may be going on. We always, we, we can downplay that. Oh, they're fledgling. Now we could talk about, you know, every moment in, 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 in modification and change um, in the royal houses of Europe and England and, and maybe in other places, but, but, we, but, but maybe we pay sort of problematic attention or context um, to, uh, you know, maybe what royalty looks like or how, how to manifest um, in so many mirrored ways throughout Africa. Um, but, but, but even with that too, the tensions that may go even, even, even around that, right? Uh, and really in truth, Haile Selassie was a region. He wasn't even a king, right? Um, who sought development and modernization, right? Um, through the, the, the reins or the trappings of monarchy, right? Um, and when you see a story, you'll see why he was just sort of the region. He was not necessarily um, in line to be the king. His brother actually dies. Um, and, uh, you know, so think about the tensions going on here. You got some dynastic tension in the context of like, well, you know, when the brother dies, there are other family members who say, well, this person here by blood should be next in line. And that person's name is not Selassie, right? So there's tension there. And that's just within the, the, those folks within the monarchy um, and, and the royals themselves, right? On the outside, things are starting to erupt a bit too. And, and some of it's coming on with um, the annexation of Eritrea in 1962, right? And the tension uh, uh, relative to a border conflict that was beginning to emerge there. Right, uh, uh, and, and really, really, what all of this sort of signal was the fact that 
many people felt like the royals and the monarchical class had a foothold on power throughout the entirety of the country. And, and, and the other ethnics, which included folks who had descent lines that went back to Nubia, descent lines that go back to um, other early cultures and peoples and civilizations regionally there, right? Who had very strong, strong, strong sort of, sort of, sort of uh, identities and ties to this land, right? Felt like they didn't get a, a participatory hand. They felt like only certain ethnics were allowed to engage and others were not, right? And, and, and so in 74, the Ethiopian army rebelled and they imprisoned, they captured and imprisoned um, Selassie, right? Um, and they in, 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 in install something called the Dirge, right? Which is just essentially a Marxist military council to rule Ethiopia in, uh, in 1987, right? So, so just imagine this sort of moment, right? Um, you, you, you got uh, um, a, a country that's tired of its monarch or its representative of monarchy, you know, it's tired of it because it's looking around and seeing that only maybe certain folks are benefiting and others are not, right? And then you got tensions with land that like, remember, I mean, I mean, I mean, sometimes people would just take land and hold it as, as a manifestation of their royal power, not necessarily do anything with it. So where does that leave folks who could develop that land and could use that land and could eat and survive off that land? Well, when it gets to a point where there's a famine, that's gonna be a problem. And don't you know that uh, the very important conference that we always remember, Live Aid, was around the very issue of humanitarian aid to Ethiopia in the wake of the violence brought on by the Dirge regime, right? So this just gives you an idea of what's going on here, right? Um, and then again, folks, I think some of well received um, initially because the talk of reform was there, right? But then the, the Mengistu, Mingist, um, who's the head of this, uh, this Dirge regime, right? Um, brings in some Soviets um, and gets some inputs from them. Um, and then not to mention all the other things that are going on in and around the state in these, during this time as well, they start adding to this, right? Uh, um, and then you have allegations of human rights abuses. The famine, as I described, because you're not, you're not able to feed people. Some of this land stuff was brought on by prior generations. And it just happened to be that these guys were disorganized and had a lot of big talk, but maybe didn't do what needed to be done in terms of reorganizing the society, right? And so a, pep, a, a popular coalition of rebel groups um, led by the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front comes in and topples this regime in 91, but they do some severe damage. And, um, you know, description of what happens with uh, uh, Haile Selassie is kind of problematic. Um, there's some suggestions that, you know, they take him and bury his body uh, under um, the uh, palace, essentially under the desk, under a desk in the palace, essentially, um, to ensure um, from what some said that his body would be used as a, a martyr or a tool to rally uh, people around, this kind of thing. It's an interesting sort of story. And, and, and we can sort of leave it there because some of what will come out in our reading of um, some of our documents as well as some of our exploration of some of these other issues will bring us a lot uh, uh, more current to some issues of our past, uh, maybe what's going on since uh, 1991. So, <clears throat> all right, so now let's just sort of switch gears a bit and we want to look at Kenya, right? Which is regional. And, and again, you can see I, I did some sort of some pop-up flashpoint examples. I picked two places in East Africa to sort of maybe get into some, some analysis of some things in the modern era, right? Um, obviously there are other places you could pick, right? There are other ways you could look at this. You could look at uh, Anglo-Sudan and Ethiopia and a dual mandate look at what's going on in that region with the British and the French and their involvement in there from about 1848 on and talk about also sort of an emergent uh, Pan-Africanism, right? And that's another reason why Du Bois is gonna equivocate Pan-Africanism to, to those places. And, and I guess missed sometimes in the conversation, I would argue, right? But you got like people like an Ali Muhammad um, in the 19 teens and 20s, man, they're firing the thing up. They're, they're, they're circulating it around. They're getting the noise around. They're, they're communicating with Gandhi who at the time is in South Africa and that stuff's getting circulated up to the writers and critical thinkers in British, British Kenya, back to Ghana, Nigeria. Right, translated into other languages. So there's some there's some circumnavigation of dialogue at work there. So we don't want to you know uh, down, downplay that completely, right? 
uh, uh, but, but it's a feature of things, right? Um, in, in this region, but, but, but this is just one other place that's maybe another node of consciousness. And again, I guess too, we should always probably sort of add, well, it's British. So, you know, that makes extrapolating and making sense of the history here a lot easier for us because, you know, of the nature of us being able to read the English, right? Um, but when we think about these people, when we think about uh, Kenya and the people who live in the region, uh, the Kikuyu, right? Uh, um, are people of a matrilineal or a Bantu matrilineal um, 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 people, right? Or, uh, or that's sort of one aspect of their or origin, right? And settled in a region uh, near uh, Mount, Mount Kenya, right? And these folks, um, as they integrated with some of the other sort of local people there um, and begin to settle in this region as well, um, you know, small states, you know, uh, you know, small groups, but organized in interesting kinds of ways, right? I mean, for one thing, people, the, the idea of the group and the corporate responsibility, the community is central to everything. The individual stuff is what people look down as, as uncivil or as unethical or as even selfish. Imagine that in a community, right? Where, you know, we, hear, we, we, we sort of celebrate individuality to some degree, right? But, 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 but look at a culture that, what would that mean? Where group and corporate and community responsibility would be at the central, right? Uh, I mean, collective action all the way in, all the way up and down, collective responsibility, those kinds of features, right? And, and, and then a clan system and an age grade system, the Mabari and Marika, based on, you know, that, that your ability to move up and down within the, uh, the, the system. Right? How do people attain status? Right? What status is based upon? Right? Uh, well, certainly land plays into uh, uh, um, um, status. Right? Um, and these sort of contractual, sort of uh, 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 lineal group, um, um, sort of uh, relationships um, to land. Right? Uh, um, but but still, I mean, so so you can so so land is is maybe a, a central commodity because of obviously what it, it, you know you you are able to use land to do obviously for for those kinds of things right but but in a, in a, in a, in a society that um, as it evolves becomes more perhaps patrilineal uh, with, with these sort of participatory rights uh, um, how does that sort of there's some interesting things going on here right obviously. Uh, uh, because the matriarchic belief system doesn't go away. It, it, it kind of reminds me in some ways, but I would stop short just a little bit because I think the Akans would say definitely that they're, they're just sort of centrally matriarchic. But you, you see it as a very male and patriarchal society, just a pullback, just one layer. And it's, you know, uh, matriarchic and, and, and female sort of authority and, and participation is integral to everything. You know this kind of stuff, and you know not the only society where that sort of features, but but so status can 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 gender can plan status as you can see there, but not entirely. And play in these kinds of systems, when you talk about small clans, you talk about corporate responsibility. One of the highest regards you can probably guess is placed on what the elder, regardless of gender. Age trumps gender in these societies, not always, but in many instances, age trumps gender. I hate the way that I have to describe that, but I, let me just say gerontology plays a more a vital role, right? In the way that um, you know you become, you know, and even as you know, you get past the stage of being um, sort of uh, you know within separate sort of male female societies within a sort of small clan system like this, or or, or maybe orders or sects or organizations of the of, of the group, right? That are that are based on. Um, this, these sort of uh, distinctions, right? But as you get to an elder stage, right? Once you get to maybe 50 or 60 or something, you get beyond the sort of childbearing years, it becomes your age that matters. Being the wealth of wisdom that you bring, period, right? And, and so that kind of thing, I think is kind of interesting to consider in light of uh, these folks as an early feature of, of their um, 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 sort of uh, society, right? And of course, it's just like, I mean, it, it's not intentional, but just the way power is, because what will the calling? What would a British come here and see that they want? The very thing which is 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 is, is believed to be contractually possessed by every lineal group within each clan. Everyone has a right to its an engagement and use of it within each clan. And, and, but but what do the British come in and do? They try to take. They try to alienate. They try to annex land. They come in and take land. 
I mean, and, that, and that's part and parcel with the colonial system, but just the way that it works there, you, you know, you sort of see the, the problems of it, right? As I mentioned earlier, you know, and we talked about some in class, the Great Lakes, oh, the Great Lakes. I mean, they just got some beautiful, beautiful, beautiful stuff in there. Uh, there's a documentary about the fish. I hope I can find it about the perch there, how they do that. If I can find a clip, I'll show it um, because it just reminds of how much, uh, you know, resources and other things there were there that people wanted to take advantage of, particularly uh, on the British, right? Um, you know, and if you get folks over here and get people in the region and get people engaged in, um, you know, you know, uh, plantation economy, coffee, other kinds of, 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 you know, cash crops, mines, gold, diamonds, other resources in the ground, uh, other supportive services for the settler class. I mean, just imagine that, you know, this, this is the thing, right? Um, and so, yeah, a, a policy to pacify the people and to get taxes and wages and take the land this was the approach, right? Uh, uh, this was the plan, right? Um, and, um, you know, um, technology opens the door, right? You got a railway that goes from Mombasa and Kenya to Lake Victoria. Uh, man, you know, you just, this, is a, this becomes a doorway to sort of bring in and, and, and encourage more and more uh, uh, settlement, right? And, and, you know, early on in the game, uh, the British order of effort to control and dominate various uh, regions in Africa, they begin to bring in people from Southeast, um, from South Asian economies to come in uh, as a sort of, oftentimes a class that was uh, sort of dependent on the colonial system. And then they would, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a problematic legacy because it, it, it's, you know, um, if you bring an uh, outside group as a settler class to operate on top of the indigenous people, what does that look like? Right, not very nice. You can imagine, right? Um, and a lot of tensions come from that, right? And I mean, I mean, you know, I always make the connection between, you know, sometimes going in communities where, you know, um, you know, you go to a gas station and it's not owned by the local people who live there. It's, it's not owned by them, right? And why is that the case? Um, What's going on there? How is it that maybe perhaps you know um, groups maybe have ownership in these in these places that that are considered you know this is a black community this stuff is black owned this kind of thing what's going on there right why are why is that even a point of contention right why why is there even just aren't the most successful neighborhoods those that integrate and, and make sure that all people have access to development and resources and these things well that's exactly what hasn't happened over time. So that's where that tension comes from. But just imagine this dynamic, dynamic of bringing in a settler class and a foreign settler class to sit on top of the indigenous people. Um, again, I mean, I, always, I, I feel like I almost wanna talk about sort of the way people equivocate uh, inner city sorts of features of inner city, um, the problems of the socioeconomic, problems of inner city and urban existence with colonialism. This is part of that. If you, but, but then that, this is a tie people won't, maybe won't make, all right. But anyway, I, I'm getting off track a bit, so I won't, I won't go that farther. But you really do have a, 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 an added point of contention that comes in with foreign investors and foreign resources coming in to operate on, on top of, of the local people, right? Uh, and then, then look at how the numbers speak, right? So if the majority are Africans and you have a small number of uh, Indians, you have a small number of of, of Europeans, right? Right? I mean, I mean, come on, right? This is not a system. And, and, and why would the uh, local people at home or in Europe or in England be critical of European settler rule in the context of this, right? Some of it has to do with those very demographics that you see right there, for sure, right? And, and again, why, I mean, some of you probably could read some tension in my discussion around um, you know, bringing in outside a foreign settler group. And why that's a point of contention. Well, it's a point of contention because look at what's happening. As you're bringing in these groups in as a separate group to have access at least to resources, not on the same level, but at least access to resources, right? The locals are under the native registration ordinance, which says from 1950 on, you always have to be working. Uh, they're under the resident labor ordinance of 1918 right, which said that uh, um, you can't even occupy land unless you're actively using it, you're actively using the coffee, you're actively using the maize. Remember, they tried this in the Gold Coast and what was the response, right? Um, and um, even 
you know, you had to be growing stuff. Like, I mean, can you survive off coffee? Can you survive off coffee? And some of us may, myself included, may think maybe, may, maybe you can just a little bit, but hey, I would say, you know, no. So, um, wow, that's not gonna help out, right? In terms of developing the local systems or anything. And, and, and by the fact that you have these people in a system that you know, maybe just short of slavery is also very problematic as well, right? Um, and so they have no really status to compete. And, and it's exactly, yes, as Franz Fanon describes, uh, two societies, both socially and ec economically begin to emerge, right? And so there's real tension there. Uh, uh, um, and the Kikuyu are leading some of this language, right? They're leading and um, the politicization of this fight over land and over forced labor, right? Um, and began to resist and react to this. And, and, and to mention, and, and also to let let's, us not forget a very separate and segregated society, right? And so people get fired up. It's not just um, Jomo Kenyatta, who you see there at the top right, that everybody knows about other people, Henry Duku, there are many other names um, who become engaged and become impassioned by these issues and fired up to sort of fight again and to take a stronger stand, right? Um, and um, so do something called the KQU Central Association. They, um, they start to articulate these concerns, right? Maybe in a more scholarly way. I mean, as you'll see from the documentary bits we'll watch on Joe Kenyatta, he comes from the sort of English school of thought. He's less radical in some ways than some, maybe some of the other attempted sort of efforts by others, Duku and maybe some others who say, you know what, uh -uh, this, this has got to stop up. Like not now, but like right now, right? And, uh, um, you know, people start getting bound to um, each other. Oath making is a powerful tool. We're gonna to look at that in summer class um, because it comes up here in terms of binding people to the Mau Mau group who take these oaths uh, by blood and by other means. And it's described there in the text um, that we'll talk about in class, right? And it would affiliate the local people. So you can imagine it taking on a radical tenor. Right, because not everybody wanted to hear Kikuyu's ideations of, hey, let's, you know, maybe walk through the sort of more critical analysis, critical unpacking, I guess, of this uh, sort of issue in a way that he could maybe, maybe, maybe even, and, and ultimately it's going to prove to be the smart path. Um, but, but, but um, in, in a way that perhaps would, 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 get, would, would gain allies in Europe. And, you know, yeah, I mean, you're, you're at home, you're off this place, off your land. And you know you have this sort of quote unquote elder statesman who may have some cultural respect and, and, and acknowledgement as a leader and as a provocative voice in Europe, but someone who hasn't even really been in, in at home, back home in Kenya in a while. You know, so other people have other ways and, 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 and organizations and other, pro, another means of politicization, right? And one of them including, included killing or assassinating a chief, uh, Waru, Waruhu, Right, who was considered just a sort of a puppet for the British. And so when he's killed, a state of, the, of emergency is declared by the colonial administration, right? And Kenyatta, who hadn't even been back in, in, in Kenya that long, he was just happened to be in there, maybe somewhere just came back. And, and really, you know, and maybe he's living off of the movement, but it's just like a lot of instances. He becomes this sort of instant scapegoat. They grab him up and do him in jail. He said he was the main instigator of that. And in the wake of that, um, some people put the number as high as 100,000 people that were tortured, murdered, and maimed by a British counterinsurgents in an effort to put down the Mau Mau Rebellion, right? Um, and um, just leaves, I mean, just think of the, you know, this, the, the, this level of violence and what this will do to the country for, for, for in the future some, you know, it'll have some, some, some lasting impact, right? Um, but it is a collective group of, of a com combined group of folks. And it really takes a, a former student of mine, a former grad student of mine who was a film filmmaker to remind who was from Kenya, to remind me that, yeah, not everybody agreed. Nah, we were not all on the same page. Not everybody was a Kenyatta-ist or, or, or loved Jomo this way. I mean, he wanted to make sure that, that point was very well known and expressed in the way people made sense of this. And I have to sort of acknowledge the truth of that because ultimately it's gonna be the sort of collective of, of, of ethnic groups that are gonna lead the country towards independence. But Jomo Kenyatta's their head. So there, so you have that. And as you see the film, you, you, you'll get to see some about how that will play out and what impact that has on, on Kenya today, because we, we do get to maybe talk about some of what's going on in Kenya today. All right, so we'll end right there.